So, Garrett, as we jump in today, um, the last section that we covered was section 133 through 134, which both are completely out of their time, the, the historical setting right. in the Doctrine and Covenants. So we have to go back two episodes to when we when we covered section 132, which was ending in July of 1843. And now all of a sudden we pick it up in section 135 and realize there's been no canonized revelations in that almost a year, that, that 11 month time right. period, and yet there are a lot of events a taking of place events in this happened. 11 yes. months. So, yeah. so help, us, help us set the stage for Carthage Jail June 27th, 1844. <laughs> That's a pretty tall order because there are a lot of events that happened during that time period. And probably the most important to, to note is that um, this is a time of increasing uh, persecution of, of the Latter-day Saints in Nauvoo, and it's, it's a time period in which the Saints are becoming increasingly frustrated that they are not able to get people to help them in their difficulties that they have. Uh, they're still trying to get their lands back in Missouri. Uh, they, they're still petitioning the government. You know, most Latter-day Saints are aware that that Joseph went to D.C. and 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 met at least briefly with the president of the time, Martin Van Buren. And you know, it, it, however you want to say, you know, your cause is just. We don't know exactly what words are said, but what we do know is the federal government didn't help. So we know that help was not forthcoming. Well, so. As 1843 progresses, um, there's a couple of things going on that are, are leading to both internal and external tensions. So internally, there is increasing pushback to some of these very radical doctrines that Joseph Smith is teaching. They're some of the ones that we you know, prize as Latter-day Saints, but to other members of the church, especially some of those in Joseph's inner circle, they they did not feel so good about it. So uh, it, it's it's easy when you talk about this time period to talk about the controversies surrounding plural marriage. And plural marriage is a big part of the controversies that are going on here, but they're not the only thing going on. Uh, there, there's, there's a couple of other uh, things that are, that are going on as well. Joseph is, is, is teaching things that are increasingly becoming difficult for traditional Christians to accept. Um, one of the things that Latter-day Saints probably don't generally think of, is one of those doctrines, is the idea of baptisms for the dead. Uh, the, the, I would guess that most people think that baptism for the dead is it's like the greatest doctrine we have. Like, so, so God's fair and everyone can be saved. Everyone's got an opportunity. Yeah, everyone has a chance. But to Latter-day Saints who grew up in these, these Christian cultures that, that, that were very adamant that if you did not have faith in Jesus in this life, you went to hell— it seemed a bridge too far, and people, you know, left the church over it. Well, Joseph's expanding on that even more so as he begins to teach more about the nature of God um, and uh, as well as the, the nature of marriage, not just plural marriage, but the idea that marriage exists in the next life. which can is, be sealed forever. It is also rejected by the, the, the traditional Christian community. So um, uh, that's causing some internal dissensions. They're still dealing with the fallout, uh, which you've probably already talked a little bit about, uh, John C. Bennett and his, uh, I, I don't know a good word to use for John C. Bennett, at least not in mixed company. So uh, John C. Bennett is a, uh, uh, his apostasy and lies that he has told about how plural marriage is being practiced is being published all over the country. The press is picking it up and yeah, running with it. Everyone loves it because it, you know, it's, it it's, it's salacious and it sells, but it's also, you know, so false. Uh, so, so much of it is just made up out of whole cloth, but that's inflaming sentiments. Um, so, so you have that going on internally and, and you're going to have some very high profile apostasies surrounding these new doctrines that Joseph is teaching plural marriage, eternal marriage, the idea that man was uh, has the ability to progress to become, to like, become God. like a God. That, that was mind-blowing. That's a big deal. And that God wasn't always God. I mean, uh, in, in, in Christianity, I mean, the aseity of God is it's a, the essential aspect of God, that God has always been God. And for a Christian, you know, the, most Christians anyway, that what they mean is that 
in the beginning, there wasn't even time and space. There was nothing but God, just God. Mm-hmm. Um, that leads to that, you know, the quote that, uh, uh, to the effect that St. Augustine, you know, was asked, well, what was God doing before he created everything? He's creating hell for people to ask questions like that. But um, the, 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 that, that is the most fundamental aspect of God to traditional Christians, mm-hmm. that God has always been God. And so when Joseph begins to teach that there was some kind of progression whereby God became God and that that similar progression is open to to us. Yeah. And as we get exalted, God then yeah, takes that, a higher exaltation. That is, that is, I mean, it's, it's blasphemous to other Christians today. It is saying that the most fundamental nature of God, as far as we understand it, is, 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 is wrong. And, and so it, it causes a lot of, of tension. Now, externally, they've always had, you know, some problems in, in Illinois, but they especially have problems in late 1843, and a lot of this stems from the fact that, uh, I, I, this is going to be a newsflash to, to you guys, but, so people sometimes get really passionate about politics, and at times, they decide that they're going to hate people purely on the basis of what they believe politically. I know that wouldn't happen today, but in the past, in the past, in the, in the past there were times that people were so passionate about politics that they treated each other like garbage over it. So just imagine a world like that. And, and uh, uh, what's rapidly approaching is the, is the 1844 presidential election. So let me let me set the stage here very quickly. You have two major parties yeah. in 1844. You have the Democratic Party, and then you have this Whig Party. The worst named party ever, like the Hair Club for Men Party. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it derives its name from uh, uh, the opposition party in England that was opposed to the power of the king in favor of the power of the parliament. Well, uh, anti uh, Andrew Jackson was. America's first real populist president who had just this incredible amount of power because he had so much public support. He was a war hero. He was the common man. He drank a lot of alcohol. I mean, you know, it's every, everything you everything want. Everything they wanted. The and um, he, he, he started to be referred to by his opponents essentially as, as King Andrew I because he was, he was pretty dictatorial. I mean, uh, in fact, you know, you have uh, the most notable case, the, the, the Supreme Court case, uh, where, you know, in, when you study early American history, there are like so many times that you kind of, you know, put your hand over your eyes and say, oh man, I wish we, I wish that didn't happen. Well, this is one of the few times that you're studying early American history and, and they got it right. I mean, this is the court case of the Cherokee who are being forcibly removed from their lands granted to them by a treaty. The Supreme Court rules that the Cherokee can't be moved and Andrew Jackson. <laughs> hasn't moved anyway. So, you know, essentially says something like Justice Marshall has his ruling, now it's him enforce it. So, so he was acting in a way that as if he didn't have any, any, uh, anything stopping his power, any check to his power. So they, they developed the, the name of this part of the Whig Party. Um, nearly all Mormons uh, had voted as Democrats and voted in blocks as Democrats all the way back to Ohio. Um, the Democratic Party was, at the time, the party of the individual farmer. It was a party that was much more uh, open to religious pluralism. So, so most Catholics that are arriving, they gravitate toward the Democratic Party, whereas the Whig Party is far more, again, these are all generalizations. You, know, you can all find, well, I know a Catholic who's Whig, congratulations. But I'm talking about a generalization that, that there, there's a much more evangelical Christian strain among, among the Whigs. So you could see why that would also not push Latter-day Saints that way. The Whig Party is, is generally a party that is, is more powerful in cities. Uh, they're pro-national bank. They're pro-tariffs on things. They're pro-manufacturing. All of those things, uh, you know, if you're a poor farmer, I don't want my manufactured goods to cost more. I don't, I don't want my, my banking. You know, so there's, anyway, there, there's the differences, uh, at least for some of them. So, so the members of the church nearly all of them are to Democrats. make a transition in Nauvoo. At least Joseph Smith does, and that's the problem, because where Joseph goes, They're and, going and you to might follow. be surprised, uh, you know, people are going to follow him. So Joseph had always been a Democrat and, and, and um, had, had voted that way. And even in, in Missouri, it's actually a, a, a Whig politician that actually sparks the Mormon war in Missouri. And so even though Governor Boggs is also a Democrat, and, and there could be a lot of angry feelings toward Democrats in Missouri, 
they, there's no positive feelings toward Wiggs toward either. either. Yeah. And when the Latter Day Saints arrive in Illinois, because they're all known as reliable Democratic voters, again, hard to believe that the Democratic legislature of Illinois is like, come on in, let's give you a charter. I mean, that, again, it's it, the, the reality is politicians do things for political purposes all the time. So early on in Illinois, the Whig papers and the Whig politicians were generally antagonistic towards the Latter-day Saints because they represented this new voting bloc that was opposed to them. Well, in 1842, Joseph Smith signals his willingness to vote for a Whig uh, 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 candidate uh, for the legislature, and that be, kind of begins this process. Also, as the 1844 election is approaching, people are pretty certain that the Democratic nominee— it, many people think it's going to be Martin Van Buren. So the same Again. president, yeah, yeah. He, the incumbent. He, so, so bad, well, he, he's, he's like uh, Grover Cleveland would later is what it would have been because he was the president and then he got, John Tyler became president and, uh, well, William Henry Harrison became president and then died and then John Tyler became president. Um, I, that the idea behind it was that he was the most prominent Democrat. He was probably going to win in convention and and so Joseph is, you know, he, he writes a letter to Martin Van Buren saying, you know, do you have anything else to say for yourself since we last met? Um, but he doesn't expect anything to change. On the other side of the ledger, the, the Whig Party is, is almost certain that their candidate's going to be Henry Clay, the great compromiser. He has had some correspondence with Latter-day Saints and even at, at one point provided some, you know, legal, you know, advice on things. But he's also a champion of the Constitution, and he's a champion of doing what's right, at least publicly, what he says. So Joseph Smith, in late 1843, really places his, his idea behind Henry Clay and the Whig Party, that the Democrats not only have done nothing for us, even though we've been loyal to the party, the reality is they're probable president, uh, they, they're wrong, but that what they think, who will be president at the time, is on record saying he's going to do he's nothing. not going to help us. Not going to help them. So um, Joseph writes, Joseph Smith writes to all the declared presidential candidates, the people who had said they were going to stand for election. And, and one by one, they write back, giving him the same answer that Martin Van Buren had given them, that your cause is just, but I can do nothing for you. Not the same words, but essentially saying, I can't be bothered. Uh, you know, John C. Calhoun, for instance, like, how could the president of the United States intervene and what is a local matter, which causes Joseph to be pretty irate. Um, but the one that crushes Joseph is, 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 is Henry Clay. So Joseph had actually given an interview uh, in, in which he had, he had said he was going to support Henry Clay. Well, for a few months in Illinois, these Whig newspapers that had been all antagonistic towards the Mormons in the state suddenly became pretty positive okay. because, I mean, again, hard to believe someone would change their opinion just on the basis of politics, but that's what happens. Well, uh, when, when Henry Clay responds that he's not going to do anything to help the saints either, uh, it, it's devastating. Uh, Joseph writes him back a letter, but, but it causes Joseph to make a very serious conclusion. Two things that he does. One, he's going to declare himself to be a candidate for president. And, and this isn't because he thinks he's going to win. Like all third-party candidates in American history, the point isn't to win. I mean, it's great, I guess, if you won. But the point is to draw attention to the issues that matter to you. And Joseph does that. His party platform is incredibly radical for the time. Um, in 1840... Slavery is just not a presidential issue. It's just not. And, and, and uh, to give you an idea of how close both parties are on the idea of slavery, um, in, in the end, in 1844, the two candidates that are nominated are James K. Polk, a plantation-owning slave owner from Tennessee, and Henry Clay, a plantation-owning slave owner from Kentucky. So, I mean, the, 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 while they have differing views on the expansion of slavery, the reality is most politicians knew to talk about slavery in your presidential campaign was death. So Joseph opens his uh, platform by attacking the fact that there are millions of uh, people that are held in bondage in slavery because the skin that covers their spirit is darker than ours, and it's, it's very radical. It's fascinating because Joseph isn't making all these decisions in a vacuum, in isolation, right? Mm -hmm. Early in January of 1844 is when he he gathers the Quorum of the Twelve. They've they've had the responses from these yep. these candidates, and they're saying, 
Who, what do we do now? Who do we back? Yep. In good conscience, who do we vote for? Yep. And they didn't have a great option, and so the decision was made. Right. And Joseph? So, so that's a short-term uh, solution to that problem, right? How do we back that? But the reality is, you know, Joseph doesn't expect to win. So what happens? And, and the other is a much more long-term solution, which really affects both of these sections of the Doctrine and Covenants. And that is that Joseph makes the determination that they need to leave the United States, that they need to leave the country and go somewhere else. And it's, it's a tough thing for a, a, an American Latter-day Saint today to, to come to terms with. I, I think most American Latter-day Saints, you know, they, they have a, a passionate love of their country. And so it's hard to look back on these things from the past. But the reality is Joseph Smith has decided that American democracy is, is a failure. And it's a failure because it won't protect the rights of minorities. And when you're a hated minority group, then that means anywhere the Latter-day Saints move, it will always be more politically advantageous to treat them badly because they're a hated minority. So the idea is we need to go somewhere where no one else is. It's, hard, you know, we can, we can hard to be the hated minority when no one else is there, right? Or at least, uh, the, at least a much smaller population. So, they, so Joseph's going to take these efforts to do that, to uh, establish a Council of 50, which is this organization that is designed to, um, it's going to seek out where the Latter-day Saints are going to move to. So all of this is going on in late 1843 and now early 1844. At the same time, Joseph is, I mean, he's, he's preaching publicly some of the more radical doctrines that he's going to teach, such as the King Follett sermon in, uh, in April. And so you have some high-level apostasies. The, the, the largest of these is William Law. William Law is going to uh, ostensibly differ with Joseph uh, over plural marriage and over the idea that there's mankind can become like God, the idea of a plurality of gods, uh, and the idea that God himself progressed. This tension is going to lead to eventually the creation of the Nauvoo Expositor, which is a, a newspaper published in, in Nauvoo, which attacks church members by name, attacks their doctrines, and points out multiple reasons why the church is, is gone astray. Um, initially, William Law is going to found his own church, um, but that's actually pretty short-lived, and later in life, he's completely, he's, he's decided that all Mormonism is just a, a, a farce and that he's left that. Um, the Nauvoo City Charter, so this is going to be a part of, uh, this is going to be something that will be certainly unique and different to a Latter-day Saint today. But remember, the Democrats were actually pretty eager to get the Latter-day Saints to settle in Illinois and not in Iowa because it was a whole bunch of Democratic voters moving in. They grant a charter for Nauvoo that is incredibly broad and giving a great deal of power. Nauvoo has its own court system. Nauvoo is allowed to have its own militia. States have militias. Counties have militias. But Nauvoo City has its own militia as a means of, hey, we're not going to allow this kind of murder that happened in Far West and at Hans Mill to happen again. Well, the, uh, uh, the charter granted the city of Nauvoo the ability to remove nuisances to the town. When this newspaper began publishing, it made all kinds of accusations that Latter-day Saints were committing adultery, that Latter-day Saints were embezzling tithing funds, and again, naming people by name, the city council uh, determines that this is a libelous press, meaning it's a press that's spreading lies. Now, today, if, if, if someone's printing lies about you, you can still take them to court for libel, and you can get an injunction, and then they'll stop putting things on their Facebook about you. But uh, then, obviously, laws are not as developed. And so the, the city council, and Joseph is the mayor, they order the destruction of the press as a nuisance to the town. This sets off a, a series of events that will lead to Joseph Smith being arrested and placed in, uh, in Carthage jail. So, so for timeline, the Nauvoo Expositor prints its first and only in, edition in June, on yes. June 7th, yep. and it's on June 10th when the Nauvoo Council votes this is a public <laughs> nuisance. And yep. when it's a public nuisance and they're saying we're, we refuse to not publish, well, what do you do? 
you abate the nuisance. Um, <laughs> and, 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 the and, and they destroyed the press. That's what they did. They feel like they're on solid legal grounds. Uh, they, first of all, if anyone knows that presses can be destroyed and that no one goes to jail for it, it's Latter-day Saints, as they've experienced that. But th- th- the reality is they point to multiple legal uh, instances of other cities naming a press as a libelous press and removing it from the town. But far more common on the frontier were presses being destroyed simply because people didn't like what they were being printed. And even in Illinois itself, not even a decade earlier, there was a very highly publicized case in which an abolitionist printer, Elijah Lovejoy, had his press destroyed three separate times and, in fact, was murdered the third time. And there are no legal ramifications for this no, at all. Nobody was brought to trial no, for that. There's no, there's, no, there's, no, there's no legal ramifications. And so the Latter-day Saints believe, look, we're operating under what our press says. And again, they feel an urgency. Many of them felt like what caused the Mormon War in, in Missouri, where, where so much death and destruction happened, was that newspapers began publishing lies about what was going on in the church. Uh, you, you know, And affidavits, for instance, from people like, Thomas Marsh, um, uh, that that are claiming uh, that are claiming things that are wholly untrue. Thomas Marsh claims in his affidavit that Joseph Smith plans to create an Indian alliance and then march on the capital of Missouri. And after he takes Missouri, he's going to march on the capital of Washington D.C. I mean, there's there's literally no evidence for this at all. But that stirs up animosity, which leads to the mob violence. So they see, they feel like if we do nothing, they feel like if we do nothing. It's going to lead to mob violence. If we abate the press, then we're within our legal rights because legally it says this is a nuisance. Now, of course, the rest of Illinois and certainly their antagonists and certainly William Law are not going to agree with them. They are going to see this as a a violation of the freedom of the press. They didn't care so much when it was Elijah Lovejoy's press getting destroyed, but suddenly uh, the newfound love of freedom of the press is going on in Illinois. And the... Though Joseph is taken and arraigned before the local Nauvoo court by a non-Mormon judge, by the way, um, uh, they, the governor demands that Joseph be tried somewhere else. And so he demands that Joseph be tried in, in Carthage. And at first, Joseph is just, he, he and, and Hiram, you know, Joseph writes back to the governor and essentially says, we don't dare go. Because these people are saying they're going to murder us. These people are saying they're going to kill us. There's clearly not any control over the forces of this county. And so they'll cross the river, um, Mississippi River, into Iowa with the idea that they're going to leave and 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 get out of Dodge. I mean, they're going to go, go west. We're going to go west. The plan is for the church to go west anyway. We're going to go first because if they feel like if they submit to this this uh, authority uh, that that they could be killed. Um, um, what happens after Joseph crosses the river is there's word that the governor is now marching up to Nauvoo with his militia. Put yourself inside the minds of the Latter-day Saints in Nauvoo. The last time a governor marched to your capital with militia was what happened in Far West where there was indiscriminate robbery and, and uh, uh, assaults and murders and uh, the destruction of property, it, it, it was awful. Uh, I, I, you know, the extermination order in full force. Um, and so these people who've gone through that trauma, they hear that Thomas Ford is marching to Nauvoo with an army. It is not irrational that their response is, oh my goodness, that it's going to be far here west. We go again. It's Hans Mill all over again. Yeah, so they actually write to Joseph. Uh, several community leaders do, and even Emma write to Joseph, asking him to come back because they they fear that the governor will come to Nauvoo, find that Joseph is gone, and all right, let's burn this city down. I mean, that's what's going to happen next. And so uh, Joseph will, in consultation with with Hiram and others, they'll make the determination to go back. And they'll, they'll cross the river and come back. And after they cross the river and come back, they'll make their march to Carthage. And um, so it, 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 it's a lot happening in the, the, the weeks leading up to this. And Joseph seems to, to make statements over and over and over again that he, 
he seems to be getting the idea that, you know what, if we go back, uh, we're going like a lamb to the slaughter. At I mean, least, the, the, the phrase. To, uh, to, to one account, right? I mean, he has the conversation with Hiram. If we go back, we will be butchered. butchered. Yeah. And, um, you know, Hiram wants to trust that they, they'll be fine if they go back. I mean, clearly Joseph is still trying to, he's still trying to, to you know, maintain his life. He's still, you know, but there's a foreboding that really has existed even before that. I mean, he tells the Council of Fifty in, in, in one of the meetings, you know, he talks about how important it is to love people even if they aren't members of the church, right? And he says, you know, after I've used all of my means to, to, to raise a mind from its darkness, and yet that man's still inclined to his darkness, yet he would be my friend every bit as much as if he had embraced it. And then Joseph says, uh, you know, essentially, I, I can't remember exactly, but that um, uh, my my only regret is that I won't be able to enjoy the fellowship of these my friends as long as I want to. Right? He f- seems to know that things are drawing close, and and even even in his meeting with the Quorum of the Twelve in March, when when he he tells them, I I hold all these keys, and if I die, they go with me. I need to give them to you. The very fact that he's giving those keys to the to the Quorum of the Twelve, I mean, it really caps off a process that had started in, in, in 1841, Joseph had started giving more and more authority to the Quorum of the Twelve. And um, by 1844, he's giving them all of the keys of the kingdom. And again, that seems to be this understanding that that he has some kind of premonition that that his death is, is coming soon.